Um, so, you know, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you so much for all the work that you do for our community. Um, you know, I, I think uh, for a long time, for far too long, our county has been really um, inaccessible uh, to new folks who don't necessarily know how the process works. So I've just been really committed to making sure that all of our nonprofit partners um, throughout the district um, really understand how our community enhancement and neighborhood reinvestment grant process works um, so that you ha can uh, get the support that you need to do the incredible work that you do to serve our community. Um, and so that's why we are organizing a series of grant workshops. This is our second one. Um, we will continue to have grant workshops for new folks or for people who just had so much fun the first time they wanted to come again. Um, so just a couple things to, to start us off. I think uh, first thing is uh, you did have a chance to meet Cipriano at the beginning of this call. He is the point person who's really leading on uh, grants for our work for our team. So if you need anything, if you want to tell him about the amazing work you're doing, if you have questions, uh, he's your guy, Cipriano Vargas. And then the person who really supports uh, him to make sure our process in our office gets navigated and is really your other point of contact, um, you know, for, for questions if you can't reach Cipriano or you get stuck in the weeds on anything. And that's Joanna Santiago, and she is also on this call today. So uh, those are your two folks um, should be available really 24 seven for any questions. And I also have on the call today, a lot of our county team who does the behind the scenes work on how grants are processed, because there's really two pieces of the process, right? There's going through our office, which is the application and selection process, you know, as we kind of look to, you know, how do we figure out which grants and which programs to support. Uh, but then there's a whole bunch of, um, you know, technical backend criteria in terms of documentation that's required, um, auditing requirements, you know, all those pieces of the work to make sure that we're supporting uh, really high quality uh, organizations in our community and, uh, you know, making sure that we're crossing the T's and dotting the I's on the financials and ensuring that our taxpayer money is really being put to good use. Uh, and that's the county team. Um, so we have both folks here today and that's uh, from the county team. It, the, it's the Office of Financial Planning. It's Tushdi and Kathleen and they work behind the scenes to make sure that all the proper documentation is in the right place so they can process checks. Um, so I think as you all know, earlier this year, the Independent Redistricting Commission adopted new lines. And so we, we now have a new District 3. It stretches from Carlsbad to Coronado, uh, Rancho Penasquitos, Mira Mesa, University City. It's a pretty extraordinary district. I'm just incredibly honored to, uh, to represent it. Uh, but I know that it means a lot of, uh, we have a lot of new people and a lot of new communities that are now part of District 3. Uh, so for those of you who have not yet met me, my name is Tara Lawson Reamer, and I'm your representative on the county board in District 3. I was born and raised in this community. I grew up in Golden Hills and Mission Hills. I attended Dewey Elementary in Point Loma. I graduated from La Jolla High School, and I now live in Encinitas with my three-year-old daughter. Um, so if you see me running or surfing or at the park with my daughter, please say hello. Um, I'd love to meet you and get to know more about your work and what you do for our region. Before being a supervisor, I spent my entire career in public service. I'm always looking for the most effective impactful, and impactful ways to make a difference. Um, I was a professor of public policy. I was an environmental attorney. I was a community organizer for a number of years, a social entrepreneur. I was an advisor for the World Bank and the United Nations, and I served in the U.S. Department of the Treasury under President Obama. Um, so that's just a little bit about me, and there's going to be a lot of time at the end to answer questions, uh, but please feel free to put your questions in the chat as we progress, and Cipriano can follow up with you uh, with responses. So um, before we kick off, if you can please put the name of your organization and the types of services you provide in the chat. That's for everyone. This is a participatory uh, webinar. I'm getting some to me directly. 
with the foundation, uh, <clears throat> the arts education for youth here. What else do we have here? See the Greater Escondido Chamber of Commerce. You see Allison from the San Diego Meals on Wheels. Hi, Christine from the Coronado Historical Society. Jamie from Solana Beach Chamber. Oh, hi. Hi, uh, we have Groundswell um, who provides surf therapy. So that's something I actually know a lot about. Oh, so uh, welcome. Um, Jules Jackson from Wild Coast. Sarah from the League of Amazing Programmers. Um, the North Coast Repertory Theater is here. We have the Arc of San Diego. The North San Diego Business Chamber. Great, great. So many great folks. Hi, well, thank you so much everyone for being here. And um, let me turn the, the floor over to um, our county team. All right, thank you, Supervisor. With that, I'll be uh, starting the presentation and I'll start off uh, the first part of it. Uh, with that, let me fix the spotlight. All right, so with that, I'll start it off. I'll talk about our internal grant process and procedures, and I'll also hand it over to uh, Joanna from our team who will talk about uh, the small business grant and, and the internal process, and then we'll hand it over to uh, Kathleen and, and Tuesday uh, to share about the specific requirements um, with that the time that they have and uh, part of the internal work that they do behind the scenes to make sure that we process these grants. Uh, but once again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, with that, I will share my screen and move on to the, my part of the presentation. Uh, Joanna, are you able to see the screen? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, so with that, we have right now currently three uh, main grants that are part of the, of the office. And this is, you know, for every single board of supervisors. So for those nonprofits uh, that, you know, do region-wide approach, uh, definitely check in with the other offices. Uh, but spe specifically for District D, we have the Community Enhancement Grant, uh, which we've been allocating anything from 5,000 to 25,000 of funding. Uh, with that, these are flexible funding that can be used to improve, uh, you know, programming, pay for insurance, uh, offset salary cost, um, and with that pay for, uh, different events that you are doing in the community. Uh, Katim will talk more about the requirements, so I won't steal her thunder. Uh, but the next one's the Neighborhood Reinvestment Program. And for the Neighborhood Reinvestment Program, we award anything from $5,000 up to $40,000 of grant funding. And this is for hard cost, tangible items. Uh, and so this one has a more limited scope of things that you can do, but we've been getting a lot of requests for technology, uh, for HVAC systems. Uh, for those of you that uh, were working throughout the pandemic, you know, the modification and what you had to do to uh, renovate your facilities. Uh, and so keep that in mind. And then one that just came out this uh, last month is the community enhancement ARP augmentation. And this is for uh, anything that uh, is related to the impact of COVID-19. Uh, and this one, anything from $10,000 to $15,000, uh, you can apply for all three of them. Um, and so with that, definitely encourage you to look at the application um, and, and look at the requirements and, you know, look at what is your need uh, based on the work that you're doing or based on the work that you are planning to do in the coming months. Uh, but with that, the uh, time period. So currently for this this year, 21, 22, uh, we, we have two that are online and that's the Neighborhood Investment Program and the Community Enhancement ARP Augmentation. Uh, for the Community Enhancement, we have exhausted funding for this fiscal year, uh, but it does reset every single fiscal year and that starts in July. Uh, so we'll, we'll be starting to review new applications in July and starting to work for the next fiscal year. Uh, but keep that in mind as to when you're applying for grant funding. Uh, you can, you know, submit an application in December. You can submit an application in January. Uh, but definitely be in communication with our office uh, so that we can make sure that, you know, notify you if there's funding left over, if we will need a pivot to the next fiscal year uh, or any uh, other questions that come with the application. Uh, but starting on July 22, uh, that's when the new fiscal year resets. And we'll have, you know, new allocations for the community enhancement, uh, the neighborhood reinvestment program and we'll be continuing with the Community Enhancement ARPA augmentation. Uh, but with that, this is the process for this uh, Community Enhancement and Neighborhood Reinvestment Program. Uh, for the Community Enhancement and ARPA augmentation, it's an online form. And so many of you that have applied before, you're used to submitting the paper PDF copy or sending uh, the application via snail mail. Uh, for this one, there is an online application. We'll, we'll show the link after the uh, presentation. 
and you can submit all your documents, whether that be the 990, uh, the resolution from the board of directors, um, and with the, the specific request through this online uh, application uh, form. The neighborhood investment program, you can, you, um, it's a paper copy PDF. And with that, you know, sending um, that via snail mail, or you can mail it to the district office, uh, which the email is located on here. And we'll send this presentation and we'll send the attachments, um, all this information after the event today. And so if you missed the, uh, the information, you know, we'll make sure to get that to you. And so for us, you know, we try to review applications, put them on our master tracker, uh, but it is a three month process from like the uh, initial time that we get this and review it through our internal committee uh, and making sure that we have the proper information uh, that, you know, we have uh, a scope of an understanding of what the entity and what the intent and purpose is of that nonprofit. Uh, but with the, you know, the more information you provide, uh, we are looking through that uh, and definitely happy to, you know, schedule one on one meetings, uh, go visit the sites or the programming that you all do, uh, because that really helps inform us and give a better understanding of what you are all doing in our community. Uh, and then if there is additional information and I tell this to everybody, you know, feel free to uh, save my cell phone number, uh, save my email. Um, I'm always happy to review applications before they get submitted, give you uh, feedback or questions that you may have on your end. Uh, and with that, you know, things that, that are like, you know, does this qualify for this grant? You know, send me that information, send me an email, happy to follow up on that. But uh, once it's been approved on our end and we have a recommendation and the Board of Supervisors has approved that, uh, the next step on our end is um, uh, making sure that we uh, submit those applications to the county staff uh, and they will send the, um, the agreement. Um, making sure that you sign that agreement is critical because if you don't sign that agreement, they can't process a check. Uh, but once you sign that agreement, the check has been cut. Uh, entities have up to 12 months to spend those funds and then an additional month to submit that paperwork. Now it's important, you know, whatever you put in the application, that that is what you're using to um, to submit those those receipts or proof of a payment, uh, because that's you know what the agreement was in. If you're if you apply, you know, to be reimbursed for an HVAC system, but you're submitting receipts for uh, an automobile, you know that is not what the intended purpose is. So make sure you're very specific on what you are applying for, uh, so that the agreement reflects that uh, intent. And then in some cases, you know, people need an additional couple of months or uh, with that need to make amendments. If that is the case, please communicate with us so that we can make the, um, the proper adjustments. Uh, in COVID-19, you know, a lot of uh, grants uh, had to be put on hold. And so a lot of individuals needed uh, extensions to spend those funds. Uh, so if that is the case, uh, please make sure to communicate with that. And we'll send over the paperwork so that you can complete that and get that approved on our end. Other recommendations, you know, engaging the office. Um, I have met with many of you in this meeting. Uh, but if I have not met with you, you know, set up a meeting with us, uh, let us know what, you know, kind of programming you do. Uh, the supervisor is a, a big fan of data and with the, you know, what is the impact uh, that you are all doing in our community. And so any data points that you can share, whether that be uh, the number of youth that you're serving, uh, the number of uh, meals that you're providing. Uh, if you're talking about, you know, facilities for a playground, you know, how many students or youth use that facilities throughout the year. Uh, with that, any data that's specific through the uh, to the district, you know, if you're you know doing uh, supporting the homelessness across uh, the coastal communities, if you have those numbers or like you know making sure that we uh, are able to you know get an understanding of what is the regional impact or the city impact or the community impact um, is always a helpful data point when we review that internally. Uh, in addition, you know, once again, I'm happy to um, uh, to do site visits. I was at the Helen Woodward Animal Shelter yesterday and got to see some of the incredible work. And you know, it's, it's different when, when you review the application than being in person. And so definitely encourage you to uh, send those invitations, uh, but also include us in your newsletters. Um, you know, I'm signed up for more than, you know, 40 newsletters and, you know, we review those uh, newsletters and, you know, we pass out information to uh, some of our other team members because uh, some of the work you do are things that, you know, constituents calls us about and things that services that may, they may benefit from. And so that's always a plus and um, uh, with that, you know, if, uh, if there's information that you want us to share uh, via our newsletter that we do on a weekly basis, uh, feel free to send that our way as well. Uh, but items to keep in mind in the application, uh, being specific on the request that you are seeking funding for, uh, because if you're submitting an item that you are trying to get grant funding, but that specific grant is not eligible, uh, then you, know, you may run into that challenge. And so uh, making sure that you're communicating with our office. And then at the same time, if you are applying for multiple offices, 
Uh, make sure that you set up those meetings or are in communication with the grant administrator from the different offices uh, so that they know what's happening and they know who's applying um, and you know what is the uh, regional wide impact from the work that you're all trying to do. And then with the you know entities that are not in our district but do programming in our district, we also want to support them. Uh, so for example, if your nonprofit is in uh, is in Chula Vista but you're servicing uh, communities in Point Loma or Coronado, uh, put that in your application. You're still eligible to apply for funding, and that definitely goes a long way. Uh, but if you don't have that information in the uh, either the cover letter or in the uh, summary of what you're trying to do, then we're not going to know that on the back end. And with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Joanna, who will talk about the Small Business Stimulus Grant. Joanna? Hi, thank you, Sabrano. So we, we still have fundings for the Small Business Stimulus Grant, and that was um, established to help businesses who had been impacted by COVID-19, you know, because they had to, you know, reduce staffing, you know, close for the for the period of time, any, any way that you were impacted, um, we definitely want to be able to help out businesses. Um, so the grants um, amounts that we are awarding on our office is gonna be from 2,500 to 10,000. Um, we are focusing on the top five industries um, that have been impacted. Um, so we have arts and culture, education um, and health services, leisure and hospitality, manufacturing, um, and trade and transportation utilities. Um, so, you know, if you know, I'm pretty sure everybody here in this call knows at least someone who has been impacted by the COVID-19 um, small business. So maybe you're uh, dry cleaners or, you know, a manicurist or, um, you know, any small business that, that you know of, please send them our way and have them apply. We're also I take uh, applications for nonprofits um, so this is open to nonprofits and business, small businesses, which is uh, less than 20 employees. Um, so please, you know, do reach out. We still have plenty of funding. Um, go ahead. Next slide. Tip. Thank you. Um, so currently we've, uh, our office has awarded 731 small businesses um, and we've distributed $3.6 million. Um, so there's definitely been um, a lot of funding issued, but we still have a, a long way. This might not, you know, make people whole, but it will definitely help out, you know, those businesses that, that have been impacted. Um, so please, if you know anybody or you're, you're a nonprofit, you're still more than welcome to apply. Um, so please do apply. We will be providing the link on how to apply for these uh, grants um, and submit your application. And like I said, please do, you know, distribute this information also to uh, other organizations or businesses that had been impacted. Um, and thank you. Thank you for your time and please do uh, apply. Perfect. So at this point in time, I will hand it over to Kathleen. Thank you, Sabriano. Okay, let me share my screen really quick. And let me know when you see it, please. Perfect. We're able to see it. We're able to see it. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Kathleen Mendoza, and I am with the County of San Diego Office of Financial Planning. I'm here to present the Community Grants, which is the Neighborhood Reinvestment Program and the Community Enhancement Programs offered by the county. So here is a brief agenda of um, covering the list of topics that we will be discussing. First, we will start with who is elig eligible for these grant programs. Then we'll discuss further what expenses are eligible under the neighborhood reinvestment versus the community enhancement versus the new community enhancement ARPA augmentation. What funds this program, how to apply, and what happens after an award has been made. So let's start with who is eligible. Even though these are separate and distinct grant programs, the eligibility are the same. In order to be eligible, an applicant must be either a nonprofit or a government public agency operating in San Diego County. For nonprofit organizations, they need to ensure they are registered as a charity in good standing with the California Attorney General and they can conduct business in the state of California as defined by the California Secretary of State. Or you can provide evidence that your organization is not required to register 
or are in the process of being registered. So what differentiate these programs? The difference comes down to what, is, what expenditures are eligible. The Neighborhood Reinvestment Program provides funds to county departments, public agencies, and nonprofit organizations for one-time community, social, environmental, educational, cultural, or recreational needs. This grant is used for capital improvements, buying and installing equipment, buying and installing one-time technology, or to purchase food, um, including animal feed, if the food will be provided to individuals or animals in need. Um, I want to highlight that this grant is for one-time funding. This grant is not meant to be paid for, uh, this grant is not meant to be paid for expenditures that are ongoing expenses. Uh, such example is like for your annual software licenses or like rent. But this is, uh, this is a really good grant to pay for one time, mostly tangible fixed cost items. Moving forward to the community enhancement grants. Um, the community enhancement grants has to align to the purposes that are noted here, which is stimulating the tourism, promoting the economy, creating jobs, or nurture a better quality of life. So when the um, board added promoting a better quality of life, this actually really broadened the community enhancement grant of what is allowed to be spent on. But we have to make sure that when you say a better quality of life, when you make your application, you have to have a clear explanation of what the public benefit is. Both the neighbor NRP and CE grants are eligible for expenditure, uh, the eligible expenditures is one year from the award date, which will show on the grant agreement if you get awarded. As for the new Community Enhancement ARPA grant, on June 2021, the board directed the Community Enhancement funding be augmented to provide, one, uh, to provide funding for organization adversely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The funds may be used towards supporting public health and response activities associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. This one is the eligible ex expenditures, if you get awarded, can go back from March 3rd, 2021, and goes through one year from the date the grant has been awarded. I will go more into details about what the eligible expenditures are when we go through the application process. Now we're moving on to funding. What funds these programs? The Neighborhood Reinvestment Program is, um, sets an upper limit of 10 million for the program, which is 2 million per supervisorial district. As for the Community Enhancement Program, the Community Enhancement Program, every year the funding is based on the revenue received through the transient occupancy tax. And as what, um, what Cipriano mentioned before, the, both of these funding is basically is available at the beginning of the fiscal year, which is July 1st. Both the, um, the community enhancement that's funded by the transient occupancy tax and the neighborhood reinvestment program, these are both ongoing programs. As for the um, community enhancement ARPA funding, this is a one-time funding that um, one-time funding of ARPA for C eligible organizations that were impacted by COVID-19. So how do you apply? Applications are available on our website, and I will uh, I will show you where to go after um, my part of the presentation. For the Neighborhood Reinvestment Program, you may download it through the NRP website at any time and email it directly to the districts, or if you prefer to snail mail it, you can mail it to their office. As for the Community Enhancement application, we now have a new online application that I will go through. Um, and I have here on our slide, the email address of the districts. So you can email them if you have any question about the applications. After the award, as I mentioned, um, 
the CENRP grantees, you have 12 months to spend the funds and an additional month to compile and return all grant expenditure documents to the county's Office of Financial Planning. As for the Community Enhancement ARPA augmentation, you can claim expenditures from March 3rd, 2021 through 12 months and then an additional month to compile and return all grant expenditures to our office. Returning expenditures to the document requires the grantee to provide that, to provide us proof that the funds were spent for the intended purposes. So what is included with these um, expenditure documents that you provide us? Here's a list of documents that we require to be returned um, to the Office of Financial Planning as proof of the intent. Uh, that you spent the funds for the intended purpose. And now let me show you where you could get to our websites. So um, this one. So I'm going to show you how to get to the Neighborhood Reinvestment Program and the Community Enhancement Program through um, District 3's website. You go here through the resources, and you can see here, here's the small business, the neighborhood reinvestment and the community enhancement. So let's start with the community, uh, the neighborhood reinvestment program. And here you could find all the information about the neighborhood reinvestment program. If you scroll down, here's the application that you can download and fill out. And here also are um, instructions on the application. For the grant expenditures, when, you, when you're starting to compile, to submit the grant expenditures, we have here some guides and instructions for you. As for the community enhancement program, we go back here, go back to resources, go back, click on community enhancement program. So here, this is our new online um, online site for community enhancement. You don't need to fill out the paper form anymore and send it into the districts. To be able to make, uh, to apply, you will have to click here to check your eligibility and application. Oh, before we go here, um, you can click on this additional resource. This is a really good resource that shows you the application process and gives more information about what is needed um, and, um, as you go through the application. So you click here for your eligibility. There are three questions and to be able to move forward for the application, you have to click yes on all three. You have, these three has to apply to your organization. So you have to be a nonprofit or government or public agency. You have to be providing local goods and services to San Diego County. And you, for community enhancement, you have to be requesting less than or equal to 50% of your organization's operating budget. Once you click yes on all of that, you can click validate eligibility. And here is, we have information about the um, documents that will be required and more information about eligibility, use of funds and activities that could be spent on if you scroll down here, so this is where you fill out all your information. And I just want to point out this section. This is where you would know if you are eligible for these community enhancement ARPA funding. There are additional requirements and one of them is that you have to have a one year operating history as of February 14, 2020. So basically your organization has to be operating in 2019 to be eligible for the Community Enhancement ARPA. So once you click yes, it will show you down here. These are all the eligible expenditures that you can claim for expenditures since March 3rd, 2021. So for example, we do have a lot of um, organizations that have rent and mortgage payments since that date. So you can claim that. So if you do get awarded, you can claim rent and mortgage from March 3rd, 2021. And I do suggest that you 
make sure which ones you choose because whatever you choose on these eligible activities, these are the only expenditures you can claim with your community enhancement ARPA grant funds. And once you're done um, filling out all these information and attaching all the files that are required, some of them are only ARPA related, so just make sure to read through them. If it says only required, if you said yes to experience financial hardship due to COVID-19, that means that's only required if you are requesting for ARPA funding. You will submit the application and you should receive an email with that confirmation number. And this will be the end of my presentation. I will go ahead and um, introduce Tusi, who will go over the small business. Okay, there it is. Thank you so much, Kat. My name is Tuesday McGowan, and I now oversee the Small Business Stimulus Grant in the Office of Financial Planning. So I recognize some of the names of the organizations from the olden days when I used to oversee CNRP. So it's good to see that some of you made it to the other side of COVID and you're still in existence and you're still doing your good work. Glad to see that you're still here. Next slide, please. So for the Small Business Stimulus Grant, we're gonna talk about the program, the eligibility for the program, eligible activities, ineligible activities, required application documents, and then I'll walk you through a few helpful links. Next slide, please. So the Small Business Stimulus Grant Program started in 2020. It was funded by stimulus grant amounting to $47 million. Last year in 2021, the latest round of funding for the program was an additional 33 million from the stimulus grant. Today, the focus of our discussion is SBSG through the ARPA program. This program is funded by the Board of Supervisors through allocated federal ARPA funding. SBSG ARPA funds will be equally distributed by each supervisorial district, a 6.6 .6 million per district, totaling a reaching a total of 33 million for all five districts. So the goal of the program, as mentioned by Joanna, is to help small businesses and nonprofit entities impacted by COVID-19 to get them open, keep them open, and help prevent them from going out of business. Financial assistance is allocated to eligible qualified small businesses and nonprofit entities with final award recommendations made by individual district offices based on the availability of funds program guidelines, and the submission of all required information and supporting documentation. The eligible expenditure period for ARPA grants began on March 3rd, 2021, and goes through the end of the agreement term, which will differ based on when you apply and when you receive funding. If awarded grant funds, you'll be required to submit supporting documentation to show the funds were used on eligible expenditures. Next slide, please. So for those applying to the program, we'd like to inform you in advance of the eligibility requirements. So here's some key points to remember when filling out the small business stimulus application. Eligibility, you must be a private for-profit or nonprofit business headquartered and operating in San Diego County that experienced financial hardship as a result of COVID-19. Businesses must have 20 or fewer employees. This includes sole proprietorships and independent contractors must have one year minimum operating history as of February 14th, 2020. As Kat mentioned, that means you should have, you had to have been in business in 2019. Must not be, there was um, a requirement that you couldn't be in a jurisdiction with an existing program. And I left that bullet point here so that you could see that it has been changed and updated. So, Initially, if an organization was in one of three cities, Chula Vista, El Cajon, or San Diego, those cities had their own program and that excluded entities within those cities from applying. That has since been changed. So even if that doesn't necessarily apply to you, maybe you have some colleagues, some partners, some entities that you partner with in those cities that were thinking, oh, you know, we can only apply through our city and there's a limited amount of funding. 
tell them, share the good news that that has now changed. Organizations must also comply with all, must have complied with all public health guidance. Next slide, please. So eligible activities include innovation to promote outdoor businesses to protect employee and public health, payroll employee retention, including employee pay leave due to COVID-19 illness, purchase of per personal protective equipment, PPE, rent or mortgage payments. However, this excludes property tax payments and addressing temporary COVID-19 related restrictions on business activities. Other eligible activities include increasing technology capacity to enable alternative work forms, creating new marketing campaigns or business plans, paying vendor invoices, facility cleaning or restoration, training to implement COVID-19 safety measures, development of safe reopening plans, or other uses approved by the county, and they must also be CARES Act eligible. So some ineligible activities are expenses for state share of Medicaid, damages that are already covered by insurance, reimbursement to donators, donors for donated items or services, property tax payments, workforce bonuses or other than hazard pay or overtime, severance pay or legal settlements. So in order to apply, there are certain documents that are needed in advance to ensure that you can move through the application process. You need to provide your business license and that's not required for businesses in the unincorporated areas or nonprofits. You'll need to provide a 2019 tax return, the 2019 federal, 2019 business federal tax return. And if business taxes are reported on a personal tax return, the business related sections must be reported. A letter from the IRS showing your federal tax identification number, which may be known as your TIN or your employee identification number. You'll need to attach a letter showing the organizational organization's federal TIN number or EIN. And if it's not available, attach a page of the tax return that shows this information. You also need to provide monthly financial statements. If the 2019 tax return is provided, you also need to provide monthly financial statements from January 1 of 2020 to February 14th of 2020 only. Financial statements would preferably be completed in accordance with general accepted accounting principles, but it's not an absolute requirement. Additional required documents include a detailed payroll report as of February 14th, 2020, and this is just for businesses with paid employees. You'll need to provide a payroll summary from fourth quarter 2019 to February 14th, 2020. You also need to provide a W-9 form. This needs to be completed for any business that will receive funding. To expedite the process after funding approval, businesses are requested to fill out the form. And for nonprofits, you'll need to be registered with the Attorney General and Secretary of State to show proof of nonprofit status. So we'll show you a brief video on the stimulus grant process. It's only about 60 seconds. Take it away, Kat. The county small business stimulus grant program provides funding to eligible businesses and nonprofits impacted by COVID-19. Applying is only three steps. First, start by visiting the program website at sandiegocounty.gov slash stimulus grant. Then click check your eligibility and answer a few questions. Next, if you're eligible, you'll be directed to an application page. Please review the documents you'll need to submit depending on the type of business or nonprofit and where it's located. Provide the details in the fields on the page. Once you've completed the information, upload the required documents. Finally, when everything on the page is provided, click Submit Application. You'll receive an email and a confirmation number to let you know that your application was received. 
and you'll be notified at a later date if the grant is awarded. Want more information? Find resources and contacts at sandiegocounty.gov slash stimulus grant. Perfect. Thank you for that, uh, Kathleen. Or Tuesday, is that the rest of your presentation? Just a few useful links Perfect. here to share. So our main website for the stimulus grant, we also have frequently asked questions, application instructions. And then if you have any questions or concerns that um, the facts or the main website don't meet your needs for, we have an email address for the stimulus grant. So you can email, you can send an email to that email address. And once you do that, please ensure that you add it to your safe list so that our response doesn't wind up in your spam or trash. With that, we'll move to the questions and answers. All right, thank you for sharing that. Uh, with that, at this point in time, uh, Kathleen, if you can unshare your screen. And uh, this is uh, really now the time for, uh, for us to hear from you. What are the pending questions? Uh, what needs more clarity? Uh, we have been responding to some questions in the chat, but if you do have a question, either raise your hand and I will unmute you, or you can uh, feel free to put it in the chat and I'll read it out and I'll delegate to the appropriate staff. I'll go back to one question uh, that somebody asked about the small stimulus grants. Uh, what if the small stimulus grant was part of another district uh, and now that new area is now part of the district three, for example, the city uh, or the communities of um, Carlsbad, uh, Coronado. So I'll hand that over to um, Joanna. Thank you, Sip. So yeah, so if if you are new to our district, um, we are requesting those applications to be transferred over to our district so we can review and award them. So at the moment, if you have already been awarded funding, um, at the moment, we're still working on awarding first time applicants who have not been awarded. Um, so if you know someone who's like I said, never been awarded funding for the small business grant, we are still taking first time applicants first. Um, and uh, we haven't moved from there. Thank you. Perfect. I see a question here in the chat. Do businesses prevention insurance claims count as outside funding applied for? Uh, with that, uh, Tuesday. I'll have to do some follow up on that and determine and have to get back to you okay. on that. Insurance is a little bit complicated to say the least. <laughs> Perfect. Other questions from other members of the public? Feel free to put in the chat or raise your hand. All right, see another question here in the chat. If our business received a small stimulus grant in 2021, are we eligible to apply for it again in 2022? There is no need to submit a second application. Um, we are we will be reviewing the applications again if additional wording, uh, if there's additional funding to award, um, because there's already a file um, with your business, no need to resubmit one. Um, but I'd, like I said, we are still reviewing first time applicants. We're not doing uh, second rounds yet. Thank you for that, Joanna. Kathleen, a question that I get is, you know, once uh, an application is approved, um, people are excited to, you know, receive that award, uh, but with that, they don't get that check the day that that's approved. Can you talk a little bit about the timeline on that and uh, with that uh, important steps that people should uh, focus on? Of course. So once a um, the community grants are awarded by the Board of Supervisors, we do send a grant agreement to the organizations. As soon as that's signed and sent back to us, it can take six to eight weeks for us to send the check payment out. Thank you for that. A question that came uh, in the chat, is there a way to see applications on files or retrieve a copy of what was submitted? 
Uh, there's not like a public way of doing that, uh, but if you reach out to our office, we can definitely get that to you. On the uh, community enhancement, the new online application, I'll pivot to Kathleen. Um, how do you wanna handle that? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Yep, yeah, if somebody submits an application, um, mm -hmm. how um, are they able to request a copy and or see their application on file? Oh, for the organizations to see their application. Mm -hmm. um, the application is in our database. So it's, it's not where they can sign in and see their information, but we can provide that to them. And the, the document should be available within a day from submission. Perfect, thank you for that. Another question here from Shane is, uh, as soon as they uh, are awarded, um, how long until they see the contract? Okay, and I think this is the grant agreement. Mm -hmm. The grant agreement is sent within two and at the latest four weeks from the time the Board of Supervisors has approved. Perfect. And, and with that, on, on that note, uh, because of the community enhancement online application, if somebody submits the wrong file or if they forgot to submit their board of directors resolution uh, with the signatures, how would they go about making sure that, that the office gets the updated documentation? And that question, uh, Kathleen, can you help with that? I'm sorry, what was that again? The uh, uh, like when you know, people submit the online application, you know, uh, sometimes yes. they, there's an updated budget form that we request or assign a agreement from the board of directors. And so how can mm -hmm. people, should people resubmit an application or should they, how should they go about getting that updated document? So if there is a document that um, was missed to be submitted to the office, they can email, we do have a CNRP email that they can just attach that form and we can attach it manually to their account. Perfect, thank you for that. And I'll put it on the chat link right now. Perfect. And on that note, that's a, uh, you know, that's a pretty good email um, to check in on, on questions regarding the uh, back end of any of the grants, whether that be the neighborhood investment program, uh, the neighborhood, uh, the uh, community enhancement. Uh, and with the you know, staff on the back and are following up um, as they get these emails and requests for more information. All right, going back, I see, thank you, Kathleen, for putting that email in the chat. Two more questions that just came up. The first one is, uh, let's see. If somebody received ARPA funding, um, grant funding, and they are first time applicants, how will we know if they are second time applicants? Joanna, how do you know if they are second time applicants? Um, normally uh, we'd look and see if the business has already been um, submitted an application. Um, if they have a business, if they've submitted an application and has the same name as the other, we make sure to see if it's the same tax ID. That to us lets us know that um, this is the first time they've applied. Um, um, if you applied with another district, but normally it's if you only applied with us as first time. Um, if there's not a duplicate application, um, since the system only requires one application for uh, the awarding. Perfect. I have another uh, question here, and Kathleen, I sent that your way. This is from a Generations Theme, uh, talking about the 2019 tax return forms and with that they broke off from a different entity. Uh, are they eligible for the small business stimulus grant? And maybe uh, Tuesday, you can help out here, but I'll send you the application in the chat. Mm. Okay. That requires a bit more investigation. I came back to the programs a month ago, so many of these questions are brand new to me. I would say, though, so that your question does not get lost, also email your question directly to the stimulus grant email so that um, we can spend some time discussing with you in more detail and then do, then do the necessary research to let you know whether or not you're eligible. And I'll put the stimulus grant email in the chat. Perfect. And then there's another question uh, for the uh, applicants that are second time applicants. 
If we are accepting applications, Joanna, uh, will they be notified? Yes, um, our office will reach out to you, sending you a congratulatory email, letting you know that you've been awarded funding uh, from our district, from our office. Um, and then we'd also give you next steps as to give, you know, the Office of Financial Planning some time to put all, you know, review your application, make sure they have all the proper documents um, and send you out the contract. Normally that is taking, um, it's taking a little bit longer to process than the CEs and the NRPs, just because of the amount of applications that we are receiving and um, reviewing. So we always say, you know, give them a couple of, oh, I would say two months really to uh, make sure that they review and get back to you with the contract. Perfect, thank you for that. Uh, another thing that I, I've been seeing uh, more on the back end is um, when nonprofits are not in good standing, whether that be with the attorney general's office, um, or the uh, Secretary of State, uh, that delays the process on iron. We, we can't give any grant funding. And so yeah. with that, that's a process that's not, you know, within our jurisdiction, but we definitely encourage you to uh, make sure you reach out to those uh, specific entities to resolve any issues. Because uh, that way, when we are ready to give that um, grant, you know, we are able to uh, move through it and with it not delayed. Uh, typically on iron, you know, we're, we're, we're doing about one grant per letter per month. And so depending on the timeline and when you submit that application, uh, you may not hear from us, you know, two to three months, but if you are on the back end and that grant, um, that verification of being in good standing is not there, then, you know, that will delay the process. Uh, 